Hello, and welcome to Informed Decisions. I am Sheen Mashtarden Greenberg, the Career Assistance Advisor for Barksdale Air Force Base. <coughs> so this, these are the expectations while you're going through this today. I do expect that you watch the entire video, have something with you to take notes, uh, take screenshots if you need to, take pictures of that, whatever. Um, you are going to be asked four questions throughout the seminar, so we need to write the answers down to those four questions. So this is what we're going to go through. Uh, we're going to spend quite a bit of time on pay and entitlements, and then we're just going to cover the other uh, the other topics briefly. Uh, we're going to talk about some personnel programs, but it's just to make sure you have up to date information. I'm not going to go into detail on any of those things. So why are you here? Because you have to be. So do I. Uh, this is congressionally mandated. Um, um, course that you attend. It's supposed to be 12 to 15 months prior to your date of separation to make sure you have this information in order to make, guess what, an informed decision um, about separating or re-enlisting. Because, as, as I'm sure you have friends, I have many friends that are, that have gotten out and they, they, they wish that they didn't, um, they got out earlier, and they said that they thought they were going to make more money, they didn't realize what we actually had while, we, while we're in, and they they regret it. So I just want to make sure that that doesn't happen to you and your family. So we're going to go through a bunch of different things today and then to help you make an individual decision for you and your family, not for your work center, not for your supervisor, not for anybody else. This is just about you and your family. So why do people stay? It's usually for similar reasons as why people re-enlist. Maybe not for you. Um, I didn't re-enlist for the same reason that I first enlisted. Um, but just think back. I really, when we're in a group setting, like to ask everybody, why did you enlist? So think back for yourself, why did you enlist? And is that working out or did you go in a different direction? Um, and things like that. So why do people leave? It might be for a reason that's up on this, this screen right now. Um, just think to yourself right now, what do you think the number one reason that I hear people leave? Some, most people say pay. All right, so that's not true. The, the number one answer that I get though is leadership. Yes, leadership is the number one thing that I hear people um, consider separating or actually make the decision to separate. So if that is the case for you, just please keep in mind, um, especially if you've only been at Barksdale or you've only been in one squadron, um, people come and go. And while it, 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 it sucks in the moment, I get that, um, don't let someone else make this decision for you. If you're getting out because of toxic leadership, whether it's just your supervisor, maybe your whole chain of command, I don't know. Um, you're giving them control over your decision. So instead of doing it because of someone else, make sure that you're doing the right thing for you and your family. There are all the other options. So this is the first question. Are you planning to re-enlist, separate, or are you undecided? If you do plan on separating or are undecided, have you attended TAP or are you scheduled to attend TAP? On VA benefits, I'm sorry, Mr. Joe can't be with us today, but um, so these are some things that Mr. Hayes, our VA benefits advisor, is able to sit down and discuss with you. He does get the most questions that he gets are regarding education benefits. So he can go into detail with you about um, which direction should you go, how do you, how do you opt into the, the post 9-11 or forever GI Bill, um, how do you go about um, giving it to your kids and everything like that. What are the eligibility? Do I have to re-enlist? All of those things. He can help you out with all of those. Uh, the other big one is home loans. He helps out with home loans quite a bit as far as just the process goes. And then everything that he would do is going to be on the ebenefits.va.gov, which is eventually just going to be uh, va.gov, and you'll have to navigate to the ebenefits area. So this is his contact information. Um, his office is actually, it's if you're walking into the uh, MPS or the Deers area for like ID cards, if don't go all the way into the to the room. He's in the first little hallway in the first office. So for the Transition Assistance Program or TAP, uh, this is a required again another congressionally mandated program that is required for all personnel, and it starts a year before you actually separate. This is why we say if you're planning, if you're undecided or are planning on separating, you're supposed to be in this seminar 12 to 15 months prior. So now you should be set up for success as far as meeting all of these timelines um, regarding your transition. And we say even if you're undecided because 
we don't want you to have to scramble at the last minute if you do make it the decision and go down that path later. So we wanna make sure you're set up for success. If you do attend and are undecided right now and you decide that you're gonna re-enlist later, that's perfectly fine. Uh, attending CAP does not lock you into any decision. So just keep that in mind. It's still really good information. Um, so it'll help you out and it's good for three years. So if you attend now or, and, and then say you, you extend for one to three years, um, you don't have to attend again as long as it's within that three year time period. So this is what you go through in CAP. You start out with the, just the initial counseling and that's going to be that, that year prior. And then the pre-separation counseling is like a, a half day if that class um, that you'll go to it with Airman Family Readiness. And it's just like a quick um, this is what we need, what, which direction are you going to go? Here's some things to think about. And then you will, at, the, at that, decide what are you going to do as far as your workshop goes. Everyone has to attend the first three days, that transition workshop. And that, um, that looks like this. So you'll have one day where you just talk about the transition. The next day is just about VA benefits. So you're with Mr. Joe for the whole day. And then the Department of Labor actually comes in and does a whole day employment workshop. So, and then you have an option of attending these other two day tracks. Um, each of these is two days. You don't like get all of them in two days. You have to decide. So education track is a two day class and then vocational track is a two day class and so on and so forth. So if you're planning on getting out and just going to school, the education track is probably a very good option for you to go to. Um, if you're planning on going to community college or anything like that, does all of it all work. Um, the employment track is if you're just going to get out and hit the ground running and get a job. And then if you're interested in owning your own business, there, there is a track for entrepreneurship as well. So this is what it all looks like um, in one slide. So the, like I said, you start off with the initial counseling a year prior uh, and the pre-separation counseling is a year prior. And then you just, you should need to attend CAP um, no later than 90 days prior to your separation. I get a lot of people that come in and they, they didn't even know that they needed to attend TAP. Um, so unfortunately, most of them are within that within 90 days of separating. So we gotta walk over to Airman Friendly Run and find out like, what can we do to get them into a class? And if, if you wait too long, they're gonna make you do an online version and it's just not, not as good. So you really wanna go through the full class to get all of the information. So this is the, the TAP team over at Airman Friendly Readiness, you can get any of them by just calling their, their 8400 number um, to the main desk and then tell them that you're interested in attending TAP. All right, so if you're interested in Palace Chase or Palace Front, uh, Palace Front is where you attend um, after you, like you separate from active duty and then you immediately join the Guard or Reserve and the Palace Chase is you're actually leaving early from active duty, uh, cutting your contract short and then going into the Guard. So for you, since we're so close to your separation, a lot of people do, they, they do Palace Chase because guess what, you retain a whole bunch of benefits when you do that. So if you wanna talk to, sorry, this is the Air Guard. We actually have in-service recruiters on base here. They work over in the, the building that's right next, it's in between the Red Cross and the, and the, the BX. Um, so in the, it's, it's right next to the BX. Uh, they share the same parking lot. Um, that is where our in-service recruiters are. So we actually have a, an Air National Guard person, um, Master Sergeant Randall, who is in guard, but he his sole duty is to, to get people, active duty members, to join the guard. Same thing for the reserve, which I'll show you. Here's the reserve recruiters. Uh, that's, that's what they do as well for the reserve. And there doesn't mean they're like poaching active duty. It's people who are already planning on separating. Um, and instead, they just want, this is how they, they go through your benefits. What are you going to retain? How does it work? Do I have to work weekends? Can I work? different? Can I get an active job? They can ask you or answer all of those questions for you. All right, so question number two. When are separating personnel required to attend precep, the pre-separation counseling with the Airman and Family Readiness Center? All right, so I said we're going to spend quite a bit of time on paying entitlements. This is basically our compensation package, and this is where I'm going to show you what we do have while we're in, so that you can't say, I didn't realize that we, or hopefully you can't say, I didn't realize what we had while we were, while we were in and I didn't realize it was so expensive out here in the, in the civilian world. Okay, so most of you should be a senior airman um, and then at your four-ish year point, you might not be at four years yet, you might be at three years, but you're close to senior airman if you don't have it on already. Um, all right, so this is what you should be making when you're out of the dorms. 
and W slash O is without, and then dependent rate, rate BAH is the housing, and BAS is our, our food allowance. So that's what it means without dependent rate and then with dependent rate. Okay, so if you put just the BAH and the BAS in there with, with our annual, just our annual salary, uh, we're already up to 50, if not over $50,000. Okay, so, and that's four years. If you think back, what did you need when you, what was your re requirement to actually join the military? Do you remember? A high school diploma or GED, right? And uh, not even like a stellar criminal background, honestly. So you didn't require any school further than high school and um, that's it. So now you're a five level, um, you're training, probably training other people. Uh, we've trained you, so you're, you're good, your experience is there. So now you're getting $50,000. And again, this is just annual salary, housing allowance and our food allowance. All right, so then at Staff Sergeant, at eight years, this is a very attainable goal, um, a, a very attainable goal. The average is probably six years for Staff Sergeants um, to, put, to put on, but so at eight years, that, that's a couple more, right? Um, all right, so now we're up to almost 60, if not at $60,000. Again, you don't have to have any further schooling or anything like that, but now you're gonna be a seven level, um, you're gonna be more responsible, so we're gonna pay you accordingly, right? I do feel that that is the hardest rank to wear. There's just so much going on because you're now you're in seven level training. Um, you have to go to ALS. You know, now you're a supervisor and you're responsible for other people. That's crazy. But you're also still working. So it is, in my opinion, and a lot of other people that I've talked to, but it is the hardest rank to transition into and wear. So if you can just just hold on and and keep just keep going, um, it does just get better. So. This is tech sergeant at 12 years. Again, very attainable. I, I actually tested three times for tech sergeant and I still sewed it on. I, it was like in my ninth or 10th year, something like that. Um, so again, no, no further schooling is, is required still, um, just the experience and, and um, training that, that the Air Force has provided you up to this point. So now you're at almost 70, if not over $70,000. <clears> All right, so Mass Sergeant 16 years, again, very attainable. I, I also tested for Mass Sergeant three times, which I know you don't have to test anymore. Um, but uh, so I tested three times for that as well. And I sewed on in my 13th year, I think it was. Um, it was right around there. So again, still no further schooling is required. Um, it's just the just experience and training that we provided. Um, so now you're up to, if not at $80,000. That's crazy, after 16 years, with nothing except for what we're, we're providing for you. So senior, like at 22 years, this is uh, again, very attainable. I tested twice for senior. I know you don't have to test anymore, but I tested twice for senior and I sewed it on in my 17th year. Um, so, the, and that was right along with many of my peers. Um, in fact, I've had some friends who sewed it on um, the year before I did. So you can do this. If I can do this, I promise that you can too. I'm not the golden child of the Air Force, I promise. Um, so if, if I can do this, I know that you can too. So now it's out, it's around 90,000 or over $90,000 a year. And again, this is just annual salary, housing, and food. And chief, this isn't even a 30 year chief. This is just a 26 and we're, and we're in the, the, the 100,000. So um, again, more responsibility comes with each of these. If you look at the Air Force as a business, which you know we're not, but if you were gonna go to a business on the outside, they're gonna do the same type of thing. If you if you apply yourself and if you, you know, you get the training that you need and you um, work hard and you do your best, uh, they, they reward you, right? So now they reward you with promotion. So now you're getting promoted, you're doing the same thing. We kind of, I think it's a fast track because if you look back, there's a staff sergeant at, at six to eight years, right? I mean, you're already supervising people and making that amount of money with no other training and experience required other than what we have, or the Air Force has provided you. And you don't have to have any other um, degree requirements until you become a senior master sergeant. You do have to have an associate's degree at that by that point. It doesn't have to be the CCF anymore, um, but you just an associate's degree, which the CCF counts as an associate's degree. So um, you can use that if you don't have another one. All right. So I said all the other stuff that that we have behind the scenes. This screen has um, the other benefits that we take advantage of. I guess. Um, that weren't included. These were not included in the monetary values that were on the previous slides, except for the two asterisked ones, our food and housing allowance. Those were in there. 
Uh, so the LEAD program is the best thing that I've ever experienced or seen. So um, at my 10 year point, you know, that make or break, um, I had actually considered separating and I looked into other organizations and I, you know, talked to family and friends and found out about their, their time off programs that they had their LEAD program. And it was just horrible. <laughs> Basically, that was the reason that I re really re-enlisted at my 10 year point was our LEAD program. Um, other ones, other companies have, or companies have just different programs out there, but the most common one I saw was that you can get a, a one to two weeks off after staying with the organization for two years. I was like, so I'm not gonna get any time off after two years, that's insane. Um, and then you got two weeks of sick leave each year. So that means if my kids get sick, if I have to stay home because they can't go to school, any of that kind of, any, anything, or if I get sick, um, I have to take sick leave for those things. So in the, in the, in the Air Force, a convalescent leave is our sick leave program when we have an unlimited supply of sick days. That's, yes, unlimited. They don't keep track of how many days did you take? Okay, was it necessary? Anything like that. It's just, if the doctor says, okay, you need two weeks after surgery, cool, you get two weeks after surgery. If your supervisor says, don't bring the flu to work, stay home for the day, cool, you stay home for the day. You don't have to take your own leave for those things. If your kids have an appointment, if you have an appointment, you don't have to take leave for any of those things because you have to take care of your family members and yourself. So um, yes, unlimited supply of sick days and the 30 days of leave years is amazing. Um, and then you get to this point where you have user leaves. I finally got to that. Um, I like my time off. It's important to me. It's why I like our leave program. I, I love my family. I want to spend time with them. Um, so I finally got to the point where I had use or lose last year. And hey, guess what? If you don't take those days, your commander gets in trouble. So you have to take those days. It's an awesome problem to have. <laughs> okay. Uh, also, primary and secondary caregiver leave is our maternity and paternity uh, leave program. So the the mother of the of the baby actually gets 42 days now. It used to be six weeks. It was six weeks forever. Um, it was, it was, yeah, anyway. So it was six weeks forever, now it's 42 days. And then the secondary caregiver leave, so the, the child's other parent can get up to 21 days off. Um, and then, so for the guys out there, I know um, that sounds, let's, it should be equal. It absolutely should be equal, but it's a step in the right direction. It was zero for like 70 years. So just keep that in mind. And then it was 10 days for a couple of years and now it's 21. So while it should be equal, I, um, it is a step in the right direction. And if the, the, the other parent um, is not, so the, sorry, excuse me. If the mother of the child is not active duty and cannot get the, the six weeks off of, of leave from their own um, business or from their own job, then the, the active duty member who is the other, the spouse or the, the other um, parent can actually take primary caregiver leave because you can't take babies to the daycare until they're six weeks old. So it's actually written into the AFI. It's in this pretty, pretty cool call. We do have an SRB program. So you can go to my PERS and type in SRB and find out if you'll get any money if you re-enlist. Um, it did change. It changes twice a year. So it, I think the new one just came out. Uh, clothing allowance we get, it's usually about $420 every year. It's over 500 just for the time being as we phase into OCPs. Um, so that was cool. I was actually able to go buy two full uniforms with boots and like all the other um, accessories that go with it. Uh, so I didn't actually have any out of pocket with that, that $500. But normally it's every year on the anniversary month of your, enlist, of your enlistment, you get, it's about 400, I think it's just over $420. Just remember to use that to actually make, like get your uniform ready. Make sure your blues are up to date, that you know where they are. Um, you have all the right ribbons, the lapel pins, which seems to be the most common item that's lost for some reason. Make sure you have those. Um, and then our food allowance we had talked about already. TDY PCS expenses, we actually don't have to pay it for nearly anything when we move or go to training or on any other TDY. Um, so for example, um, if you go to San Antonio for training, um, they'll, they'll pay for either if you're going to drive or if you're going to fly. So they'll pay. Um, They'll pay for that. And then so that's all the gas expenses, the, the car, um, wear and tear in the car, and then lodging, they'll pay for that as well. So, and then um, if it's on base, you'll, you're expected to stay on base, but they'll pay for the lodging. If, if wherever you're going is off base, so they usually pay for all of that as well. And then you get, it's like not very much, but you'll get some uh, per diem 
So it's like a little bit of extra like food allowance, basically. It's not a whole lot because you're still getting BAS while you're, you're CDY or getting or um, PCSing. Uh, to go with the PCS expenses, um, they'll, they also pay for, they'll do, you could do a, a Diddy move, which is where you actually pack up your whole house on your own and you get a truck and you, you know, you drive all of your belongings. Um, or you can just do a regular PCS and they, they'll, the, the Air Force hires contractors to come in and they pack up all of your stuff. I mean, like they'll box everything. You just have to take the pictures off the walls, basically. Uh, so they'll box everything up for you and then the, um, a moving company will come and they'll put it all on a truck or in crates on the truck and then they'll take it to your new to your new home. Um, so they do all that. It's amazing. Um, I have one friend though who does, he's done Diddy moves. He's moved four times and he just, he did it himself every single time and he said he usually makes about $4,000. Um, but that's what they would pay the contractors to come pack up and move all of your, your belongings. So if you do a Diddy move, they're basically paying you instead of the contractors. Um, and then for uh, permissive TDYs, that's with that's a TDY with it's basically leave without being on leave. So this is if you do recruiter's assistance, that's that's a permissive TDY. If you go run the Air Force Marathon, that's permissive TDY. Um, there are a number of there's like 40 different reasons in the AFI that you can do a permissive TDY. If you go get PRK or LASIK surgery, um, you have to go to I don't know where the closest one here is probably San Antonio. Um, if you so if you go do those things, that's permissive TDY. So you, you're, you can go and you're not on leave status, but you're technically TDY. However, with the permissive, we do not pay for lodging and travel expenses. A dislocation allowance also with the PCS. If you, um, depending on your rank and where you're going, you'll get at least $1,500 just for moving. It's expensive to move. Think uh, first and last month's rent. Um, Utility deposits, carpet cleaning. If you have a dog, the outrageous amount or um, amount of carpet cleaning at that point. So the, this money, this dislocation allowance is, is just to help offset those costs. And you can actually request advanced dislocation allowance through CPTS if you if you need that money up front. Otherwise, you won't get it until you you get to your gaming base. If you go overseas, some locations do COLA and a utility allowance. Uh, for example, in, when I was in Italy, we, we got both. I used my COLA, believe me. It is, it is very expensive to live overseas. But the uh, utility allowance, depending on the type of house you get, um, gas was very expensive where we were. So they would give us a separate allowance to help with that, with the heating of the house and everything. So that was very helpful. Um, Family separation pay, if you're away from your family for longer than 250 days, or sorry, excuse me, for longer than 30 days, you get uh, $250 per 30 days. And they do prorate that. So if it's like, if you go to NCOA and you're gone for six weeks, they'll give you, it's just, I think it's $8.80 or something per day. So they'll prorate it for the, for the additional days, but it has to be at least 30 days that you're gone. So if you go to, on a remote tour, um, and you're away from your family for a whole year, you'll actually get this two, that $250 every month that you're gone. And then not to mention 100% tuition assistance. Um, it's just awesome. Um, I've just got my master's degree and I've, I've never paid for anything. I didn't pay, I, the school that I found even um, includes books and tuition. So I didn't pay for any books or anything. The only thing I've ever paid for my entire schooling was a $20 online library fee when I started my bachelor's program. So that's pretty awesome. Um, so now my kids will get my entire GI Bill, so that'll help me out in the future. 100% uh, medical coverage, we're going to cover that just uh, briefly here in a little bit. And then our retirement and our TFT. Okay, so most of you are probably in blended at this point, but I, uh, there's going to be a lot of you that are not yet or that, that didn't opt in. And for whatever reason, I don't know. Uh, there was a lot of misinformation, I think, pushed out when, when this whole thing started, and a lot of people that should have opted in did not opt into the blended. Uh, so hopefully, if you're planning on separating, you did opt into the blended retirement. Um, but if not, this is, this is the, the high three that you're in then. So I'm in high three, of course. Um, there wasn't a blended, you know, way back when. But um, so this is, this is what that looks like. So you have to do the full 20 years. Um, if you get out at 20 years, you're going to get 60% um, of, of the pay based on the last three years of your service. So we call it the high three. So if I get out right now, like next month at my 20 year point, then um, I have been a senior for two years. So they would take the two years of senior pay 
and then the one year of master pay, and then they would average that out, um, and then I would get the fifty percent of that, and then I get two. So if I stay in, now I get two and a half more for each year up to the thirty points. So if I stay in for thirty, it would be seventy-five percent of the high three. So the retire or the blended is um, is different, right? But it's it's the same calculation except it's forty percent instead of fifty percent. Um, at the end of, of the 20 years, but you don't have to stay in for the whole 20 years to get to get something out of it. So that's why this is awesome. If you um, like it shows on the screen, only 14% of active duty members actually retire from from um, active duty. So that's 86% of people that under high three have left with nothing. Um, so it's now at least I'm blended. If you stay for four, 10, 15 or whatever, at least you're getting something out of this. Um, hopefully you're contributing as much as you can, as, as soon as you can, so if you can afford it. So if you can, if you can afford to contribute 5%, that's awesome. So you're actually, the government will match and you'll be getting um, 10%. So that's cool. Okay, so that's the pay and benefits. Um, now we're gonna go into how does your, your current job translate to the civilian job? So I like to use, ammo as an example for this, the two WOs, because what do they do? They build bombs, right? So how does that equate to a civilian job? And you can't say contractor or working as a GS employee in ammo, because that doesn't, that's cheating. I meant like if you just wanted to go get a civilian job not associated with the military, what would a bomb technician do? All right, so this, this website, it's onetonline.org. That's how you say that. This is a very great tool. Um, you go to this crosswalk section with the red box there, and then you can, this is for a crew chief, but you can select any of those things. So like a crew chief's gonna be able to do the majority of those, of those things. But, um, so for this one, we selected first line supervisor of mechanics and, and whatnot. Um, so this is the, the civilian terminology of, of what that job does. So where do you think this would be helpful? On a resume, of course. So this is, we do not speak civilian, but it's just not the same lingo. We use different, different terms, different um, acronyms, everything can be different. Um, so this is what we do in civilian terminology. And then if you scroll all the way down on these pages, you'll come to related occupation. So if you were to look up a 2WO to ammo, uh, you would see warehouse supervisor, warehouse manager, um, logistics, because they, they ship them all over the world. You would see supply chain management, um, all those types of things. So the, the behind the scenes stuff that you don't think about because you just think, well, I'm a, me I'm, I'm a, a mechanic, so I have to be a mechanic when I get it. You, know, you don't necessarily need to unless you want to, but um, there are a whole bunch of other things that, that you do, especially at the point that you're, you're in now or getting to because um, you're supervisor and all those types of things. So this is a very great tool. It's ownetonline.org. Uh, so this is a comparison. I uh, used that website down there and I pulled this up in January. Sorry, this was based on 2019, but I, I pulled the information in January of 2020. But this is the percentage of civilian organizations that offer the same sort of um, support that, that we do in the Air Force. So I like to point out, um, so the relocation pay is 34%. So other businesses, sorry, businesses will pay, 34% of businesses will pay relocation pay for you to move because they want you, you know, to move, but under family paid travel or paid family travel expenses, only 2%. I found that very interesting. I also found it that the cost of living differential that COLA was talking about, they only, only, only 8% of, of businesses um, do that. The gym membership, because we do have a global gym membership, only 32%. And then paid paternity leave is only 34%. And then the, the paternity leave is 30 that went up, it used to be 1%, less than 1%. I didn't even have it up here because it was such a, it was so low. All right, so here is your question number three. How much is family separation pay and when is it authorized? All right, medical benefits. So like I said, we're just gonna do this briefly, but I think we all know that it's expensive to get hurt, but how expensive is it uh, for all those things? So this is just, having a kid um, with no, no complications. This is the national average. So it's gonna, it could be different, of course, based on where you're at, what city, um, region and things like that. But this is just the national average um, in 2011. 
Um, so think this was, was uh, nine years ago. So think of how much it, it would probably have increased by now. So just for the cost of having, this is the maternity care. So by the time, from the time the mother finds out that they're having a child or that she's having a child. And um, so for the care at that point, and then for labor and delivery, and then the initial infant care until they leave the hospital. So that is this cost. Now, let me ask you this question. Do you have $10,000 saved up just in case you're, you're going to have a baby? Um, or if you were to have a, find out that you're going to have a baby tomorrow, do you think that you could save up $10,000 in the next nine months? That's a lot. <laughs> and then, I don't know, do twins run in your family? That's crazy. And this is again with no complications. So if there's any sort of complications, it's, uh, it's gonna increase everything just in a crazy amount. So uh, one of my friends had, had twins and a, a lot of twins are born early. So they were in the NICU for two months and it was $100,000 per infant per month in the NICU, and that, was in, that wasn't here, that was in Virginia, but I, that was outrageous. Uh, so insurance, of course, that's where the insurance comes in. So this is for a healthy 18-year-old non-smoker um, with no pre-existing medical problems. I did pull this again in January, um, and it's based on Blue Cross Blue Shield of Louisiana. So I had to create these scenarios um, and, and figure this out. But guys, I'm just gonna ask you this question. When you were 18, how many times did you go to the doctor? unless we made you or your mother that doesn't count either like you just went because you needed to if we were in a class i have had in three years one person say oh yeah i went i, I had a sports physical i had to go to okay fair enough that was one person though in for three years um of, of doing this this seminar so this is where the insurance comes in so you would have been paying 330 dollars monthly just in case you got hurt and then you have to have that 4500 dollars um in case you have some catastrophic thing, like if you break your arm or you, you're actually hospitalized for something, you have to pay um, that deductible. So that's it. Like once you pay that deductible, you don't have to pay any of the co-pays or anything anymore. But for every time that you would go, it's, it's a 30% um, co-pay at each doctor's visit. So now this person, okay, cool, they're adulting, they're married um, in their 30s, they have two kids, and so now they're paying $1,000. Uh, instead of, of 300 and that yes I don't know if you uh, if you have kids uh, but they they go to the doctor a lot they get sick a lot especially if they go to daycare or they're in school now because they're it's like the outbreak monkeys um, but I, they come home they bring all of that stuff home because they're all in such a small space together okay so the local services and facilities that we have here and at most locations uh, especially uh, Stateside, overseas, the only thing we didn't have, and I was at a really small uh, place at Camp Darby in, by Livorno, Italy. It was a very small base. Um, we only had 200 active duty, including Army there. Uh, so, but we still had all of these things except for the skeet and trap range because you were not allowed to have guns there. Uh, but everything else we still had there. And so I, in stateside, we, like every base that will have these things. I don't know about the splash pad. I added that in here because we do have one here now. Um, but we have the pool is over there by the fitness or by the, the club. It's a very cool, it's awesome pool. Um, there's another one in base housing. Um, if you like to tinker, the auto hobby shop is, you can rent a lift for your car. I think it's like $7 an hour. Uh, with the fitness centers, again, we have a global gym membership. It's pretty awesome. I've used the gym, like when we're just um, in Pensacola, for example, um, I needed, I wanted to go for a run and it was raining outside. So I went to the Naval Station there to use their fitness center. Uh, the hunting, fishing, outdoor rec, if it ends in ING, they will have equipment there for you to rent. Uh, like they do hunting, fishing, camping, biking, kayaking, canoeing. You can even rent a camper, um, all those things. So, and then they also do trips. So they'll do a whole bunch of like single airman trips or just trips in general. And they'll, they'll provide the equipment and then you can go um, with them on that trip to go do that activity. Same thing with ITT, information tickets travel. So that is in the, the MSG complex. If you walk into the main door, it's the it's directly to the left and you'll see it. There's a picture of like Mickey Mouse out there and a, and a cruise ship and things. They do discounted tickets for so many different places. Do not buy tickets for places until you contact ITT to see if you can get a discount. Medieval Times was like almost a 50% discount. Um, you can get a Four day park hopper pass to Disney World for $240. Uh, that's, that's less than if you get a regular two day pass at the park. 
Um, so don't buy, like I said, don't buy any, any tickets until you talk to them. They also do free trips, um, especially single airman trips, or they just do some other ones too. Um, they also give out free tickets to things sometimes. That's how we get the a military appreciation night uh, to the Mudbugs hockey game. They gave out free tickets and they, they do those types of things throughout the year. The fam camp is $20 a night for full hookups if you do rent a camper or if you have one. So that's how my family of five gets around now. It's really expensive to fly, so we just don't do it. Uh, so we use our camper. We can go from base to base, and it's $20 a night, and we have basically our house that we're moving with us, um, and we don't have to, to drag everything out and go get in a hotel or anything like that or pay for a hotel. It's $20 a night. It's pretty nice. Tenting, I think tenting is um, 4 to $6 a night. So some other things that we have, the commissary, you do save about 30%. I fact checked that. I saved 28% compared to Kroger. Uh, that's closer to my house. And you can also put in special requests. The BX, I still buy my high dollar purchases there because they price match. Um, they, it's tax free. And if they don't have it in the store, you can order it online and they will ship it to the store for free, just like, like Walmart. Um, the Shop Ant Class 6 also are tax free. The CDC, if you have kids, I don't know, maybe they're going there. Um, it's, it's based on a tiered income level, so it uses your family income. And then um, based on their chart, if you, depending on what that is, you could be paying anywhere between like 60 to 145 or something um, a week. So my, you saw what, my, what I make. Um, so of course, we're in, we're in the highest bracket and that's okay. So on base, it's, 100, it's roughly $125 a week for my, my daughter to be over at the CDC. Um, and that sounds high, but off base, it's also $125. So for me, it's even, it doesn't matter. Um, but an airman, say like a one striper, that single family is not gonna be paying $125 on base. It's about 60 to $65. So that is the, the awesome thing about their tiered pay um, system. So off base, that airman would still be paying the $125 because they don't care. It's just, this is the rate and this is what you're gonna pay. But on base, it's based on how much money do you actually make. Okay, cool, it's less, so we're, you don't have to pay as much. Um, in Virginia, this is where I came from, they, uh, we paid $240 per week for one child off base. That hurt, um, the CDC was full and we didn't qualify for the stipend. <laughs> but the airmen, um, or a younger, it's actually a staff sergeant and below, they typically would, um, qualify for the stipend. So even though they couldn't get into the into the the on base CDC because it, it was full and there was a waiting list, they 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 paid the difference for them to, to have to go off base. So that was pretty awesome. Space A travel, maybe you've taken a hop. That's um it's a pretty neat system. So you can use the AMC website. You don't have to use this link. Um, you can actually just go to amc.af.mail and navigate to it. It was pretty easy to find. Uh, but so these are all of the terminals, the PAX terminals. So you can go to those PAX terminals. You do have to be on leave to get on a waiting list. But as long as you are on there, um, you can, they also, it, on the website or on Facebook, they keep those updated, like regular, like if there's a change, it will be updated immediately. Um, so you'll find out what flights are going out, um, to where, um, if there's, or how many seats are available, is there a waiting list, all those types of things. So like I said, you have to be on leave to, to get on the waiting list. But if you do this, you can, the closest one here is Little Rock. So you could go to Little Rock and say there's a flight going out to Washington. And then so you get a flight to like McCord Air Force Base in Washington. Well, hey, what's going out from McCord Air Force Base in Washington? Oh, awesome. Here's a flight to Hawaii. And that one's actually on the, the rotator. So I might have to pay a tw like $12 for my whole family to fly to Hawaii. So it's pretty awesome. The only time that you do have to pay is if you use a rotator and you just have to pay to tax. So that's where that. I think the last time that I checked into this, it was going to cost my family a five, twelve dollars, and that that was just the tax. So um, this is a really cool program. You can use this as long as you're an ID card holder. So you'll see a lot of retirees using it as well. All right. So I like told you I was going to just briefly go through some personnel programs. So we're going to talk about um, retraining and assignment. Just to make sure you have the update information. Again, you're supposed to attend this 12 to 15 months prior to date of separation. So if you do that, you're in or close to your retraining window and your BOP window. Um, but if you're not quite at that, that window, you'll notice if you go try to apply for retraining or, or a basic preference, it'll say that you're not selected under the SRP. That's the Selective Reenlistment Program. 
So back in the day, everybody actually had to apply to re-enlist. It's a crazy concept, isn't it? Uh, now it's an automatic, an automatic process. So once you get to a certain month, you will automatically, as long as you don't have a negative identifier in your record, so if you're not in like a control roster or a UIF, you will automatically receive a career job reservation under the Selective Reenlistment Program. So if you do have a UIF control roster, in order to be eligible for these programs, you have to, the, the negative identifier has to fall off while you're in this window that I'm about to tell you what the dates are. Um, if it doesn't, then you're not going to be eligible for retraining or the basic preference program. Um, however, you do have to, you have to have if it has to fall off before you actually re-enlist in order to be eligible for re-enlistment. Enlistment. And if it, um, at that point when the negative identifier falls off, you need to actually go to or call re-enlistments and extensions at the MPS and tell them that you need to apply for a CJR. All right, so retraining. So this is the window I was talking about. That's 35 to 43 months for a four-year enlistee and 59 to 67 months for a six-year enlistee. Easier to say this, it starts 13 months prior to your original date of separation. So that the month prior to your three-year or five-year point is when your retraining and base of preference program begin. For a retraining, it's an eight-month window. If you extend your enlistment, your, the retraining window does not extend with you. It's not based on your date of separation. It is based on your time in service. Uh, you do get to pick up to five AFSCs, so try to find some things that interest you. If you are deployed, uh, have an excessive amount of TDYs or are medically coded, pregnancy counts as and you're medically coded, so that counts, um, or just any other thing that, that comes up that is beyond your control. Um, and you weren't able to apply in your window, you can still apply after your window closes. So you, but you need to do so within 45 days of whatever the situation was concludes. So if you're deployed and you come back, but your window closed like a month ago or whatever, you can still apply, but it has to be within 45 days of, of coming back. If you have a medical code and it falls off, you need to apply within 45 days of that happening. Uh, if you, Miss your window for reasons that were within your control. For instance, uh, you didn't know when your window was, you didn't know what you wanted to do, you didn't like the options on the retraining advisory, or you were planning on separating and you changed your mind. Those are all reasons within your control. So you would actually require an exception to policy, but you can do that. That's the cool thing. Um, you can do an exception to policy. It does have to be signed by your commander to justify why you should still be allowed to apply. Um, just let you know right now. The current program for two A's is that you're not allowed to, your career field managers will not allow you to retrain outside of your window using an exception to policy. That does not count for people who could not apply for reasons um, beyond their control. <clears throat> that letter, you can find that letter on my PERS in the retraining section, and then it's at the, um, up in the top. I believe right now it's on the right hand side. You st also, you have to pick jobs that are on the retraining advisory. If you put down jobs that don't have any quotas, meaning they're not on there, or it says zero, you're just wasting a spot because that means there aren't any class seats available for you. Um, I know it says that if you're on the shortfall, you can only retrain into the shortfall, but that actually just changed and I, I should have changed it on the slide too. Um, it actually says that you should still, you can still apply from the advisory. The cool thing though about the shortfall, it, well, not the shortfall, about um, a lot of the jobs that are on the shortfall, is you, um, you can apply early. So if you are interested in, in um, any of the enlisted flying jobs, the 1As or the 1Zs or battlefield airmen, EOD or um, um, sensor operators, then you can actually apply at your halfway point. Anyway, so this is the MyPers that I, uh, page that I was showing you about or talking about. Um, all of that stuff that I just told you is up in that big circle at the top. The AFI is down there at the bottom, and then what you can do is just hit that apply for retraining button. It'll take you through four steps. If you don't know what you want to do, because there are a ton of AFSCs, and there's a new one that I just read about the other day. I didn't know it's uh, they just added it to the advisory. Um, you can go to that the, on the right, the the, the right hand arrow it says Air Force Work Interest Navigator. It's just a questionnaire, and then based on what you answer, it'll give you a list of AFSCs that you might be interested in. So if, again, if you hit apply for retraining, it'll just take you through a four-step process. This is the this is the, the coveted list of jobs that are available. That it's called the online retraining advisory. If you are a first-term airman, you are going to use the FCA column only. 
Even if you're a staff sergeant, that's awesome. Congratulations. You're still a first term airman, so you're going to use the first term airman column. It benefits you, I promise. <clears throat> uh, the, 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 the ranked columns, those are based uh, or for the NCO um, retraining program, and it's a much harder program to actually retrain, re retrain through. So you want to retain that first term airman status as long as you can. Uh, this is similar. It just this just updated as well. I can't get screenshots because I'm not eligible. So I'll eventually, I will get them from somebody, and I'll update this slide. But this is basically what it sort of looks like. Um, it won't show all five of those those drop downs until you start populating one. So once you hit, you populate the first one and you put in flight recruiting, the second box will show up. But you have to start. You have to just start that process. All right. So basic preference. It starts at the same time. Um, if you want to retrain and do a BOP, apply for the retraining first because you get a BOP with your selected retraining. However, if you do the BOP before retraining, you're actually not eligible for retraining if you have an assignment. So that's why you want to do the retraining first. Uh, you do, again, you have to have that approved CJR if you have to be at that that window uh, that we talked about that 13 months prior to your original data separation. Uh, did you know for you, those of you that are first term airmen that you only have to be on station for, for 12 months um, to actually get an assignment? That is all that is required. Uh, so and at, at eight months, so say you PCS here recently um, and you're first term airman and you're, you're in your window possibly or you're, you have your CGR, you still have to be on, on station for eight months, uh, but then you can apply to PCS again. Uh, it's crazy. The awesome thing about the first term airman base of preference is that the manning at your current location does not matter. So maybe you've heard you're not going to be able to retrain because you're low manned in your shop. Well, that sucks. However, for you, it doesn't matter. Um, you can still apply. However, they have to have a spot open for you. Like there has to be an open authorization for you at the gaining location. So that's usually why they don't get approved. Uh, because the places that are put down are those like highly, usually highly desired locations. Um, and they're, they're full, so they don't have any open authorization for you. All right, and I put everybody wants to go to Florida, because uh, here's, here's an example. This is from 2018. I'm waiting to get newer ones, and this is pre tindle but just using Florida as an example. This is the staff sergeant authorizations. Um, that means just they have authorizations. That doesn't mean they're opening, so it's just authorizations for all AFSCs at all bases in Florida in July of 2018. So there were 6,600 authorizations and 24,000 volunteers. That's insane. So that's why I was saying the people are picking those high, highly desired locations. I'm not saying you can't go to Florida. Somebody has to go to Florida. Uh, but the, the likelihood of going there is going to be less than you know a less desirable location. Think middle of the US. There are some awesome bases in the middle of the US. Um, off at Air Force Base, for example, was my first duty station. I did not want to go to Nebraska. I'm from Wisconsin. That is not a place that was on my dream sheet. Uh, however, it was amazing. And it, it was on my dream sheet after that. Like once I left, I'm like, you know what? I'll go back there. It was a really good assignment. The base is awesome. Um, so just, just think about those things um, before you, you put stuff down in your dream sheets or on a base of preference. Um, If, I skipped over SRB because everything that you read is in is uh, in my purse. Just go there, type in SRB. I don't think there's 72 AFSCs in there right now. Like I said, it just updated, but um, you can calculate all of it. It's all right in in my purse. All right. So if you're interested in any special duty assignments, we'll just quickly cover what those are. Um, so these are the ones that are done through the through the developmental special duty program which means that they're, they were chosen um, to be part of this program because they're positions that are literally developing airmen uh, from recruiter on through for PME uh, at all levels. <clears throat> so I know that you do have to be a staff sergeant and not all of you are staff sergeants right now, but just remember this is a very competitive program. So you wanna make sure that you are, may, are being competitive. So make sure your records are good to go, that you're doing what you're supposed to do um, and that you're not basically in trouble. Um, but so these ones are done through your chain of command, sort of. They come down their quotas, right? The cool thing about all these positions is that you get coded. Um, so like, for example, a career advisor is on here. So I'm coded 
with the 50. So I know that next year my code falls off. So we're able to project, okay, so she's done with that job in June of 2021. So we need to start planning, you know, six months ahead of time. So they're able to do that with all of these AF50s. Uh, so it's really, so we know how many ETIs we're going to need in the next six months because they're all coded and we can find out how many are going to be leaving at, in that time period. So the quotas come down, they get fair shared out to the MAGCOMs, the fair shared down to the wings, the fair shared to the groups and then to the squadrons. And then so it's your supervisors that are putting your names in for these things. So if you're interested in, in doing any of these AFSCs, these special duties, you need to let your supervisor know basically. That, uh, that spot on the back of your EPR, that the one that's basically, what do you, what do you wanna do when you grow up? Um, this is a really good place to talk about, you know what, I'd really like to be a recruiter. So you can put that in there. Um, and then if, if your leadership knows that you want to do these jobs and the, um, it'll give them, it'll help them when the quotas do come down because they only have like a three day, sometimes a three day turnaround time to get all the names submitted. Um, so if they already know that you wanna do that job, that would actually benefit them and you. Uh, local hire means that you won't PCS. It's, so they're pulling from the local population and you, you'll probably PC, well, you will PCA, but you're not going to PCS. So you'll just move over to um, CE or FSS and you'll do those jobs. <clears throat> okay, so these are the other special duties that a lot of people don't, don't think to go and look for. Um, you actually have to go into AMS, the Assignment Management System. And that is um, where you go to the equal plus listing, literally the word equal and the word plus. So you find the equal plus listing under enlisted assignments and you have to go in, you put your rank in and actually look for like eight A2s and look for eight D1s. Um, but this is where they advertise for all of these special, these Air Force special duties. Uh, they also advertise there for special duties within your own career field. For instance, there was um, uh, PME, or sorry, your technical instructors, uh, maternity manager and there was a there was one <clears throat> for a staff sergeant UTM to go to some really small base that was in Spain I've never heard of it before um, it wasn't the normal ones that you've heard of uh, but they wanted the UTM to be already Spanish speaking so that made sense so it was a, a requirement that's not a normal requirement so they will advertise those types of positions in in AMS as well but if you go into like say you want to look to be or you see a spot for career so you could go in and you look for 8P0, oh great, there's one at right pat right now. So you can apply for that and it'll tell you how to apply in there as well. If it says hit the button, there's a button at the bottom that says apply and you just, that's how you apply. If it says send package to POC, you're gonna contact that POC to find out what the package needs to have in it. Um, so all of that information, all of that information is in AMS. It's a very good um, website. So yes, if you, um, the ones that come up the most that I see, so Defense Attaché actually has a, an indefinite advertisement out there. So it's a really cool job. Uh, one of my friends is doing it in Bolivia. Uh, so she went to training for seven months in DC. Her civilian spouse was in training with her because he went to Bolivia with her. Um, and then, so now she's down there and she's leading the team of Defense Attachés that are the military advisors to the US ambassador in Bolivia. So everywhere that we have an embassy, um, we have a, a team of defense attaches that are the military advisors to our ambassador in that country. Uh, I, we didn't have MIPERS when I was uh, you know, younger in the Air Force. So I didn't know about most of these until I was like at NCOA. And then my sweet mate was uh, one of the defense attaches in Bern, Switzerland. And there was another guy in my class from, that was in Cairo, Egypt. Uh, it's just really cool. Um, a courier, you're just traveling around the world carrying classified information. And then uh, missile facility manager, they're usually the 72-hour 72, 72 shift. So you'll go, you're not the security or anything like that. You're literally just managing the facility. So they have like bedrooms and they have gyms and everything inside of those. So you do 72 hours at the facility and then 72 hours at home. Uh, those are the ones that I think I get questions about the most. So, so there are they're our local hire, just regular ones as well. These are not, they don't have to be done in AMS. Sometimes it goes out as a tasker or something just to get people. Your UDMs are just pulled from within your unit. So this is the, um, if your AFSC is on that list, then you are eligible to go work with the battlefield airmen, but doing your job to support the battlefield airmen. 
Uh, you'll probably go to Pope for an interview and for training, but that doesn't mean you won't necessarily stay at Pope. Um, you do have to be a seven level and they want like the best of the best. So if you're interested in doing this, hopefully you took a screenshot or something and you just email that SD, S screen, SD screening at down there at the bottom and uh, they'll get back to you about what, what to do next. All right, if you're interested in applying for OFI, they have a completely different retraining program. It doesn't fall under the Air Force retraining program nearly at all. You do have to be at your window. You don't, but it doesn't have an expiration date. So as long as you're at that 13 months prior to your original date of separation, you have any time after that to apply for OSI. So you can actually apply for retraining. And if you're denied, you can still apply for OSI. Uh, it's pretty neat. It does not follow any of the normal retraining rules. So in order to start this process, you just contact the local detachment and just tell the agent on duty that answers the phone that you're interested. They'll, co they'll do um, um, so like a presentation. They have, the one here, they have like a presentation and, and whatnot for you. Um, anyway, so you start, they give you access to their enlisted recruiting portal. And then you have 45 days to get all of that stuff that's in blue there turned in. I know it, it looks really, it's tedious. And remember, it's tedious paperwork. However, it's pretty, pretty normal information. Um, so then, then they start the screening process. So you'll go through, uh, the, it's by the local detachment here, you'll do a screening process. And then there's another screening process. Um, and then there's a full Air Force screening process. So it does, this is a very long process, but if you stick it out, we had, Eight people last year that were selected from Barksdale for OSI. So that was awesome. Um, you do have to be a senior airman through tech sergeant. If you are a tech sergeant, you can only have been one for less than a year. Um, and then it's a senior, airman, so like a senior through tech sergeant, less than 11 years total, total, total active federal military service. So you have to be senior airman, less than 11 years. If you're a tech sergeant, you cannot have been a tech sergeant for longer than a year. Yes. Okay. And you do, uh, for all of these programs, have to have more than six months left in your in your um, enlistment. So if you need to, you can always extend for a year for personal reasons. You only get to use that extension once in an enlistment, but it is the one that we use for people who are pursuing retraining into any of these programs. So if you want to contact our local OSI unit here, just call 3881 option six and just uh, whoever the agent on duty, just tell them that you're interested. So that is how you apply for OSI. Number four. Here's your question. Uh, what was your biggest takeaway from this briefing? That's basically my survey question. Um, but this is the one that, that I get the most questions in as well. Like, hey, I, you said this, what did you mean? Or I have extenuating circumstance. So if you have anything that, that, let me know what your biggest takeaway was, but do you have any other questions? We do have, I know the SharePoints are migrating right now, but I will get um, the new one out there on uh, the, the splash page as soon as the migration is finished. But we do have a SharePoint all the exception of policy templates, all that, um, this briefing, everything is actually on that, that website or on the SharePoint. Okay, so how do you get course credit? You send an email to my org box, include your rank and name, especially if you're sending it from a personal account. I don't know who John64 is, I need more information. So please send your rank and name, uh, the answers to the four questions and then any other questions that you have. All right, thank you. If you have, if you want to submit an anonymous survey, uh, you can use that QR code and just fill that out. I will get notified if there's any action in there. Um, otherwise, this is my personal email, or, I'm sorry, my personal professional email and then my org box email. Uh, the org box will stay the same, right? So that's the point of the org box is. Um, so even if you have a question and I'm not in this seat, whoever is sitting here will be able to help you out. Um, otherwise, thank you, I really appreciate you taking an hour out of your day to to sit down and listen to this and don't forget to send me the answers to the four questions